Hello and welcome to Newswire. I am Muneeb Hamid. Even by the usual American standards, the collapse of the US-built and generously sponsored Afghan army in the face of the Taliban's walkover victory into Kabul is a fiasco of mega proportions. The habitual post-mortem who lost Afghanistan, how and why, and why hardly scratches the surface of what actually happened. When a ragtag movement supposedly crushed into oblivion by the most powerful military alliance on the planet and bombed and rebombed to smithereens for over two decades rises from the ashes walked into the very presidential palace built by the terminators who were incidentally still around watching as if in a trance to manage its terminal absence. It is not Afghanistan we should be discussing here. It should be America itself and what is left of it as a world power. Now, this focus on largely technical issues such as the internal command problems within NATO, weak planning, corruption and incompetence in the Afghan leadership. The failure of President Barack Obama's 2009 surge, missed opportunities for peacemaking, etc., is more of a distraction than an insightful analysis. Now, ladies and gentlemen, even the persistent accusations against Pakistan of supporting the Taliban are irrelevant, even if those are true. Its involvement would be no match for over 40 other advanced countries backed by America and the strong support from the tribal ethnic forces that did most of the ground fighting initially. And here we have the world's mightiest ultra-modern war machine failing dismally in a war against a marginal, almost alien military political force in one of the poorest countries in the world. This Dream Alliance, generously funded to the level of over a trillion dollars and backed by United Nations leadership and guidance in civil affairs, spent two decades amassing victories and achievements. Now, to discuss more on this in the first segment, we are going to discuss left of America and its experts in the Taliban era. And in the second segment, we will discuss Pakistan's support to the Taliban as irrelevant propaganda. And today on our show, we have with us Lieutenant General Retired Ghulam Mustafa, Defense Analyst, and we have Asif Durrani, former ambassador, with us now. Thank you for being here on the program. Now, sir, what is left of America and its experts in the Taliban era? We have to answer this question. We also have the information that we know the world's mightiest ultra-modern war machine failing dismally in a war against a marginal, almost alien military political force in one of the poorest countries in the world. Now, this dream alliance generously funded to the level of over a trillion dollars, sir, and backed by United Nations leadership and guidance in civil affairs, spent two decades amassing victories and achievements now. Sir, what do you have to comment about this? Sir, we'll go to Ghulam Mustafa first, and then we'll have the comment of Asif Durrani on this. Frankly speaking, once you look back, uh, this uh, being wise over the event, America's biggest mistake was not realizing where the real power actually lay. That was in the economic strength of the United States of America. And that is what should have been utilized, not only in Afghanistan, but elsewhere. Somehow, given their cowboy culture, they thought that power, raw military power, is what gets the job done. Not realizing that all powers, other than Allah Kareem's, all have limitations. And power's biggest limitation is that it is really very rarely understood as an instrument of policy. This is what the Americans did. They tried their level best with all the best kind of war machine that they could muster, and over 48 other countries in that region, and involving India, and involving everybody else who could actually come in, uh, having failed, brings out the subject. Now, what has happened actually is having <clears throat> concentrated more on their military power, using their economics, losing that economic edge that they had. They're actually following the same trap in which Reagan's star war had induced Soviet Union to spend more, much more than its capability. Consequently, we saw the fall of Soviet empire. And I personally feel uh, it may not be uh, in the very near future, but the reversal of uh, the single most powerful nation in history has already started. And that is their economics and what is happening within America right now 
the kind of division that you see. It was unheard of that 90 generals and admirals in the United States of America asking the leadership to resign. And even Democrats asking Biden to step off and telling him that he has miserably failed, not only over 20 years, but also because this withdrawal, which could have been managed much more easily, even if they had handed over to Taliban, I'm sure they would have managed it much better the way that it happened. And the fiasco that they've created in, the, in their wake, uh, its effects will be felt, I think, for many more years. Right. Now, Mr. Durrani, we know that what happened was no technical or logistical mishap. It was a thrashing, a defeat in all the senses of the word, and abject failure. Even in the wake of the most violent colonial wars of liberation, never have we seen an occupation that had to rush to take all its human achievements, including the translators, home with it. As routine go, this was epic. Well, uh, thank you, Munib. Uh, uh, in your introduction, you have given a very lucid uh, picture. You have uh, drawn a lucid picture about the American defeat. I beg to differ. It is not a defeat. United States is still number one power. Uh, and then uh, it is also what the generals may be talking about in the United States. But the fact is that uh, withdrawal of the American troops enjoyed bipartisan support. It was initiated by President Trump and then culminated by uh, President Biden. And uh, this uh, withdrawal was unconditional, which also shows that uh, they had calculated their pros and cons uh, about withdrawing. And then we should not also forget that this was an amicable withdrawal which is why the Taliban kept their part of the deal until the last soldier left Afghanistan. Uh, nothing happened except for the, that unfortunate incident, which was done by uh, the ISIS, which also uh, accepted the responsibility. And then uh, we should also not forget that while United States is still a power, Afghanistan is in tatters. And Afghanistan's three-fourths of the expenditures were borne by the United States. Now, the biggest challenge for the Afghans or for the Taliban-led regime would be how to run the country. And for that, I think they will be looking towards the United States. Still, they are beholden to the United States because the United States has had $9 billion of uh, Afghanistan's reserves. These are the reserves which, in fact, the United States has given. These are not the earnings of the Afghans or Afghan government. Secondly, the IMF, they are holding the $460 million tranche. Thirdly, uh, uh, the, uh, the pledging conference last year in November had pledged, uh, almost 60 countries had pledged $12 billion. Those, uh, the disbursement now seems to be in doubt. So here the lessons are that even if I will, uh, you know, number one power, super power, even if it goes militarily, it cannot achieve its objectives in subjugating the people. But at the same time, those who are occupied and those who are struggling for their independence, they also have to struggle ahead. Rather, that struggle would be much more serious and severe from the people point of view that they will have to deliver because till now Taliban did not have the liability or responsibility to be answerable to anyone. But now once they are in the government, they themselves are a government, so they will be responsible uh, for each step they take, especially uh, with regard to uh, people's uh, jobs. Uh, bring, uh, so allow the people to bring uh, food to their table, to the children, their education, their health facilities. Right now, there is an uh, atmosphere of fear in uh, Wansan, which is why almost uh, 200,000 people have left. And these 200,000 people are not ordinary Afghans. They are the ones who are educated ones. Now, the, the kind of vacuum which uh, Afghanistan is going to face would be humongous. So therefore, uh, I would advise caution. I would advise that there's no need to be euphoric. I would advise that we have to be pragmatists in our uh, analysis. And then we have to look at it that how Afghanistan can again go back to a normalcy. Because right now, 
Afghanistan is not living in normal conditions. Yes. Right. And definitely Afghanistan is not living in a normal condition. Now, Mr. Mustafa, tell us and our audience, what is left of America and obviously its team of experts in the Taliban era? And why is it that a superpower so rich in experts, scholars, pundits and policy makers keep messing up in the greater Middle East? The fact is that you try to reform other societies in their own image has never worked. Never worked anywhere in the world. It has failed miserably in, in Afghanistan, in everywhere where, where the Americans have gone. The only thing is that once they left, they left a mess so big that like the ambassador was saying, that that has to be sorted out. Not only in the subcontinent, look at Kashmir, you look at Palestine. You look at uh, what has happened in Syria, look at what has been done to Libya, and look what they have been done to Algeria, look what they have done to Iraq. Who do you think really, uh, you know, uh, bug me, frankly speaking? When UNSC met and they asked the Afghans to allow, they asked the Taliban to allow all those Afghans who want to leave, actually was a invitation for this brain drain that the ambassador is talking about. What do you talk of Afghanistan? If you tell people in Lahore today that all those who can make it to Lahore's airport by, let's say, midnight tomorrow, tomorrow or tonight will be flown off to the United States or West for their better future, I can bet uh, my last uh, penny that half of Lahore will kill the other half just trying to get to the airport. And thereafter, the mess that you can understand. It's not something that we, uh, we, must, we can forget. The second thing we must understand is that why is it that we are asking Taliban to do everything right now? Why aren't we asking the Americans? They have been there for 20 years. What have they left behind? Have they left any institution intact? Have they left a workable governance system which could run the country? What have they done so far? What have they done anywhere in this world that they have gone to? I can give you example of Iraq and I can give you examples of all the countries, other than destruction and trail of human misery. Now, having said that, Afghan's real challenge is starting now. And the failure of the Western, the American-led West would be complete if Afghan can establish some modicum of uh, normalcy in Afghanistan in the coming days. Yes, you understand. And that economy is their weak one, and the weakest point right now. And that is why it has been used as a tool. Use a tool by the West. Why would the withhold the UNSC ask the West led institutes and, and uh, release that, that they could manage the problem? As a man, right now, you've heard yeah. the uh, points made by I, Mr. Uh, Mustafa, Mr. The Rani. Uh, now, it, intentions are very important whenever we are about to invade a country or now the situation that the Taliban are in, obviously the intentions do matter now, Mr. Durrani, now. And we've seen historical developments are inherently unpredictable. Even to the actors involved in them, many of the later engaged in preference falsification, the deliberate hiding of intentions. So what were the intentions of the US here in the first place? Well, very clear. In his announcement on 14th of April, President Joe Biden stated it very clearly that while they are withdrawing from Afghanistan, now their engagement would be with China, with which he said we'll have adversarial, competitive, and cooperative relationship. So it is quite obvious. And then another indicator which we should now look at it is the day before yesterday, the UN Security Council resolution, which called upon the Taliban government to allow those people to leave the country, actually, and then in that uh, it was adopted, but China and Russia, they abstained. So this is an indicator, and it is in fact a sequel to what Mr. Biden was saying, to have a competitive relationship with China. So the new emerging uh, geopolitical paradigm is actually uh, very much becoming clear, at least in our region. 
and Afghanistan, uh, in fact, it, all its immediate neighbors, they are now on the same page, including Pakistan. Yes, Pakistan will have to have some tightrope walking, but at the same time, uh, the, all uh, major Western powers are of the view, and then the, the, the number of visits now you are witnessing that German uh, foreign minister was here, and now Netherlands foreign minister is here, and on daily basis, there are contacts at the international level between Pakistan and other countries. So this is showing that how the things are likely to shape up in the near future in Afghanistan. And then that is the regional and international part. But with regard to Afghanistan, it is uh, Taliban are also now they are different. Uh, there is a qualitative change. Uh, if you look at uh, Taliban 1.0 and now you look at 2.0, uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, very different uh, their attitude and they are uh, now they are more savvy they, they are uh, they are more tolerant uh, kabul is a normal city and uh, the kind of dress code they applied during their first tenure is uh, quite relaxed now yeah and the people who are learning about the women's rights and others so far at least uh, one can say that uh, it is normal and the women have not been subjected to any kind of coercion or repression. We definitely uh, so have seen Mr. Durrani a better Taliban. Now, Mr. Uh, Mustafa, before we go on to a break, now, I want to jump back 20 years and then come back in the present now. A few critics raised uh, fundamental issues of whether the idea of the war itself was sound, reminding us of the questionable justifications given that none of the perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks came from Afghanistan. Oh, the interesting fact is that now the think tanks within the United States are coming up with this theory that it wasn't Afghanistan, it wasn't Al-Qaeda, it was something too from within the United States of America. And uh, frankly, this theory has been in uh, circulation ever since 9-11. Uh, but this was used as justification, like the weapons of mass destruction were used in Iraq. War would never have worked. I recall uh, President uh, Musharraf telling President Bush immediately uh, after this event, when he met him for the first time, uh, then DJI Sai Sanlak was there at present there, and he, this is what he told me, that President Musharraf advised the then President of the United States of America to get out of Afghanistan as soon as possible, deal with the Taliban in, in the realm of economic, social, and other uh, fields. That's the way to get this kind of a terrorism under control. Otherwise, what you're doing is not going to work. And that has been proved too. And from then on, Jalan Kiani and everybody else in the chain has been telling the Americans. The war uh, in Afghanistan actually wasn't going to work. What for? What was the reason? Why were they here? They brought in a system which is alien to the people. They tried to impose whatever they thought is right. Democracy as a system might be very, very good, but it's not the DNA of the Afghans. The idea of war, the idea to reform Afghanistan and the Afghans in the image that they wanted was always not a failure. It's had to fail, it has failed. Uh, war uh, hasn't worked in Iraq, it hasn't worked in Syria, it hasn't worked anywhere, the kind of war that the Americans have engaged. And there were two different kinds of war going on in Afghanistan. One which is being uh, fought by the Americans, other which is being fought by the Taliban. They're fighting two different wars. And that is where the Taliban had an edge. Like I said in the very first segment, economic power is what Americans could have used easily. $300 million per day, with $50 million per day, you could have reformed Afghanistan into a different country. And America would have been here forever. Well, absolutely, rightly said uh, by Mr. Mustafa, the policy of the United States was a bit uh, false when it came to dealing with the Afghan nationals and obviously empowering and imposing a system which was unknown to them. Well, this was the first segment in which we were discussing what is left of America. And after the break, when we come back, we are going to be discussing the Pakistan support to the Taliban, which is obviously irrelevant propaganda. <laughs> Oh, 
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, as we saw districts fall to the Taliban one after another without resistance, the government in Afghanistan has squarely put the blame on Pakistan for the mayhem in the country. Now, this is because the Afghan officials believe that without help from Pakistan, the Taliban could not possibly take over, over Afghanistan. Now, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani chose to spark a war of words between Kabul and Islamabad in recent weeks after declaring Pakistan has played a negative role in the Afghan conflict. Now, to have this comment, we also now have with us, obviously, Ghulam Mustafa and Asif Duran is still with us now. I want you to comment on this first, Mr. Mustafa. It's really ironical when we hear this from the West. Two things, frankly, bug yes. me. One is that we are telling uh, Afghans uh, to behave. Uh, and we're telling Afghans not to fall back to, because we are all viewing them from that prism of 90s. These societies, they are trying to tell uh, Afghans uh, to behave. I think they need to look at themselves there also. If they can reform over the years after having you know, butchered hundreds and thousands of people and plundered country after country, why not Afghans? Why don't we give this credit to the Afghans, of course? The second is, it didn't amount to telling Pakistan that you have actually helped Taliban to get you destroyed to economically to even off something like $150 billion and get over 86,000 people killed. I mean, this is really surprising. Why would Pakistan support Taliban and import, in return, terrorism within the country? Why would that be happening there? I think there's a contradiction in terms right here, right now. Second thing is, the Taliban had other supporters. Why aren't they blaming Russia? Only because they know what Russians can do to them. Because Russia had a score to settle with uh, America. Pakistan actually was uh, a non-NATO ally. Why would Pakistan not support after having given bases and Musharraf, General Musharraf still gets blamed for whatever he did? Why would they do that? Why not Tajikistan? Why not the other countries? Why not Iran for that matter? Because Iran had a score to settle with America too. So the issue is that having failed themselves, not in every possible field, Ashraf Mani and his team and the Americans and their allies have no one else to blame but themselves. That is something very, very difficult uh, to analyze one's own failures and mistakes and come up with them, accept them publicly and get themselves corrected. That is where the problem is, and that they would never accept. Not the Americans. They can't learn. They haven't learned so far. Right, Mr. Durrani, this effort to continually blame Pakistan is not only contrary to the evidence available on the ground, but also presents a misleading narrative that masks the failures of the Afghan government itself. Now, often neglected is the role of the uh, rampant corruption that de delegitimized the Afghan government in the districts, allowing for an easy takeover by the Taliban. Now, rather than solely relying on the brute force, which would require financial or uh, covert military support from Pakistan, of course, instead the Taliban is by at large seizing territory swiftly and regularly via the local political deals over which Pakistan has no possible control. Yes, you are right. Um, now, I, in fact, uh, it, it stands exposed, uh, whatever blame game, uh, whether it were the Ashawani government or the Americans or other allies, they were uh, thumping on Pakistan's shoulders. Uh, it, it is now, you, it's very much clear, now they themselves are indulging in self-inspection, especially uh, in the West. And uh, in fact, now it has become a blame game between the Republicans and Democrats. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, uh, when you talk about Mr. Ashokani, uh, with 300,000 plus troops uh, as against 75,000 Taliban, and if his troops could not withstand the Taliban onslaught, then uh, he can't blame Pakistan for that. And secondly, Pakistan. Uh, did explain its position that we have uh, around 3 million Afghan refugees. Taliban families have been living here in Pakistan, so were the others. Even Ashraf Ghani and uh, the, these uh, Al Qanuni and uh, Mr. Karzai's families uh, have been living in Pakistan. Even when they were presidents, uh, they were living here. 
uh, half of the uh, Shawani and uh, Karzai's cabinet uh, uh, people, their families who are living in uh, Hayatabad, Peshawar, or in Quetta. So these are the things which uh, was easy to escape for Pakistan, but it did not work. The reason is that if you start believing your own propaganda, then in fact you are harming your own interests and yourself. So this is what they indulged, and that definitely got exposed. And uh, now, uh, uh, and, uh, more, uh, more than that, why would Americans indulge in talks with the Taliban? Now, in February 2020, they signed an agreement with the Taliban, almost a year and a half. And uh, just imagine that they were involved in the dialogue uh, again uh, one year before. So for two and a half and three years, they were involved in the negotiation. So it means they accepted the locus standi of the Taliban uh, the and just by see Taliban and uh, Americans, they entered the agreement. So American soldier was killed or any NATO forces. And then Taliban kept their part of the deal. In fact, it was the United States which breached the agreement uh, when they were supposed to uh, request for the delisting of the Taliban. But they did not from the get Taliban. They, right. they uh, rightly uh, said there by right. Mr. Zurani. Now, Mr. Mustafa, contrary to the claims of the Afghan government, Pakistan has been helping the Afghan National Army instead. We've seen dozens of Afghan soldiers crossed into Pakistan to escape the Taliban attacks, and in, in, and in each instance, Pakistan has provided haven to the Afghan soldiers and returned them to the Afghan authorities with respect and dignity. Let me take you back to Operation Darbe Azab when it was launched. Prior to that, Pakistan Army had been telling the Americans to come and block all those sites where our claims operations were going on against the terrorists. Americans would never do that. They did the same in, again, opposite North Pakistan. The result was that these terrorists crossed over into Afghanistan territory, and the Americans could not eliminate them or didn't want to eliminate them. Second, very interesting fact that you must understand. Ashraf Ghani and the United States actually trained the Taliban. When they're enrolling them into their own army, Taliban are smart enough to have inducted their own, uh, got their own people inducted in the army, got them trained at the American expense, got their weapons, they ran away from them. And third, very interesting tidbit that we may not realize is that the NATO forces, which are there, some of them have actually been bribing Taliban not to create any problems for them and the areas that they were um, supposed to be controlling. Actually, the Taliban also used the American money to make hospitals, schools, and run them uh, efficiently in the areas they were controlling. Pakistan got the lesson very clearly uh, very early on, and thereafter Pakistan never meant to support anybody. Why would Pakistan do that? Because Pakistan knew that it's Pakistan which is being affected. As long as the uh, Afghan soil is under this turmoil and Afghanistan is unstable, Pakistan cannot stabilize itself. Pakistan's economy cannot be stabilized. And especially after a Belt and Road Initiative was started, it was in the interest of regional countries, especially Pakistan, to get Afghanistan settled as soon as possible. So Pakistan had all the incentives to get Afghanistan settled, become peaceful, helpful to the community, to the region, and to the world at large. So therefore, I think we need to, uh, the Americans need to back off from here. And they, so the rest of the West should also back off. And they should help Pakistan, and they should actually be helping the Afghans rebuild themselves. Because any failure of Afghan state, whatever is left of it, is going to uh, bring in this kind of uh, uh, scenario that is now being uh, narrated out all over the West. That is what I think uh, we need to guard against. That is what the Afghans need to guard against. That is what the regional countries need to guard against. And I just listened to the news. I think as soon as the Afghan government has announced Pakistan, China, 
Russia and Iran probably are going to get together in Kabul to sort things out. And that's what we need to do. Right now, Mr. Durrani, talking about the United States now, which has, which is facing a very complex situation in South Asia, and is it's and it's in relationship with Pakistan, of course. Now, the U.S. government has a long-standing record of investment in Pakistan in return of in, in return for cooperation against terrorism, and but this has yielded limited dividends given Pakistan's own regional security interests. Sorry, uh, uh, can you come again, please? The question was that in the U.S. has invested a lot in Pakistan, of course, to help it fight against terrorism. But when it comes for the cooperation that Pakistan has offered to the United States, when we're talking about the in internal security threats being faced by the state of Pakistan, they still are someplace valid. Well, I think uh, it's, it's a mixed uh, bag if uh, you are talking about United States uh, assistance to Pakistan. Uh, for instance, they are still holding Pakistan's uh, coalition support funds, uh, close to $1.5 uh, billion. And uh, with regard to war against terror, uh, well, uh, statistics speak for itself. Pakistan lost 80,000 uh, of its people, including close to 7,000 its law enforcement agencies. And uh, we are still suffering because of the proxy war played by the Indians through the Afghan soil. And the uh, United States looked the other way. In fact, uh, in what happened in Afghanistan was, uh, frankly speaking, in fact, became a competitive ground for uh, Pakistan and India in Afghanistan. And uh, Afghan intelligence agency, NDS, was uh, playing uh, uh, younger brother's role with the Indians. And they, in fact, harmed uh, to a greater extent to Pakistan in stroking uh, the, the, the decisions for, uh, as far as Baloch decisions was concerned. And then they also propped up the TTP. They, financially, they were supporting them. Even now, while after the withdrawal, uh, those incidents are taking place, which means that the Indians, uh, which had uh, established their contacts with those saboteurs, those are very much intact, and those are still in the pipeline. So we will have to uh, wait and see and watch how Indians uh, 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 mend their behavior vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, and uh, and only then uh, we can say. Uh, that the Indians uh, have uh, wound up from Afghanistan. Uh, and I think it would also be incumbent upon the Taliban when they rule the country to ensure that uh, Afghanistan soil is uh, not used against Pakistan, although they have been making the right noises about not allowing their soil to be used against any other country. Yes. Right. Right, Mr. Durrani. Now, Mr. Mustafa, we know for a fact that the Taliban maintained close ties with the Tehrike Taliban and sometimes referred to as the Pakistani Taliban. Now, the TTP is responsible for the deaths of many thousand Pakistani civilians. Now, recognizing the link between the Afghan Taliban and the TTP, can we say or assume that they are the same face, two faces of the same coin? No, I think this is where uh, we are mistaken actually mixing up the issue. The TTP actually comprises of all those uh, foreign nationals and some of the Pakistani counterparts who are part of uh, the resistance against Soviets. And they're the ones who actually were, uh, you know, cobbled together as what you call Tariq taliban Pakistan and relocated in Afghanistan, the eastern provinces of Afghanistan. Uh, actually, their relationship with the what you call Taliban in Afghanistan right now may have been uh, just about uh, uneasy, but not very difficult. But they've never been uh, friendly to each other. And uh, Taliban have made it extremely, very, very clear. And they understand Pakistan's sensitivity. That there's something Pakistan cannot tolerate. It's a red line. And these uh, people were funded, like the ambassador was saying, by India. And I would even go to the extent of saying that actually supported and uh, helped by the NATO forces there, uh, having uh, the fronts having dried up, probably you find it difficult to op continue operating unless uh, uh, India continues to do that 
unless the Americans uh, can funnel some funds to them somehow. So therefore, I'm very sure uh, that Taliban, as they take over and they start running the government and they settle down, they would take this as a priority to ensure that uh, these people who are actually been harming Pakistan are either thrown out of uh, the country or eliminated. Because in their interest, because from here on, we all seem to agree that if things start going wrong in Afghanistan, the biggest loser is going to be Afghanistan and the Taliban who have actually fought themselves into this position. They are the ones who will suffer the most. They are the ones who have sacrificed the most. They are the ones who are going to suffer the most. So therefore, it is in their interest as much as in Pakistan's interest the such as groups are eliminated at the earliest. Rightly said. Now, Mr. Durrani, uh, share with us your analysis. Do you, first, first of all, if there is a possibility, and if there is a possibility, for example, if Afghanistan once again descends into a civil war, we know for a fact Pakistan will have to cope with another, another huge flow of refugees. Now, keeping that in mind, do you think we are living in a country where we can see promptly a civil war in our neighbor? Well, uh, since Afghanistan is still in a state of flux, you cannot avoid this possibility that the country may go to a civil war, provided the, uh, now the people who are in power, uh, i.e. Taliban, they actually deliver and their definition of inclusiveness satisfies all strata of Afghan society. Uh, so uh, it is a big deal. And, uh, and uh, let me also tell you that uh, 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 we may have different explanations and views about TTP and uh, Afghan Taliban, but the TTP people, they owe their allegiance to the Amir al muminin whether it was Mullah Umar or whether it is uh, Abdullah Afanzada. So they are the kissing cousins. They are the two sides of the same coin. I have no doubt about it because ideologically they are the same. So therefore, we should have no illusions about that, what is happening. And in fact, it is also very dangerous for our society, for our way of life, unless we implement strict rule of law in our country and implement our own laws. So these things uh, are going to pose a danger to our society. So my caution would be that we have to tread very carefully and we have to be vigilant, not only along our borders, but also those elements who, in the name of religion, they want to create their agenda and uh, make this country uh, vulnerable and make this country uh, uh, unsafe. Right, Mr. Mustafa, we know that Pakistan is obviously in a very uh, complex situation itself when it comes to Afghanistan on the west and obviously India on the east. Pakistan does face dangers, now most prominently from the Afghan side because obviously we do not have a stable Afghanistan at least at the present moment right now. What will happen in the future is still a very big question mark. How the Taliban are going to take care of Afghanistan? How the formation of the government is going to, uh, you know, what effects it is going to happen in Afghanistan and the surrounding regions. But Pakistan is facing threats externally and maybe internally as well. How, what are those threats and how can Pakistan manage them? <coughs> First off, I agree with the ambassador that the most important thing for Pakistan is to ensure that our internal security is at its top and uh, we never let our guards down. Uh, second, uh, I beg to differ him, uh, with him on uh, this issue of Taliban because the two have different agendas. Where one Taliban are only for one driven, one trust driven. The TTP have different agenda. Anyway, that's not the issue. The threats now. Threats are very serious to Pakistan. And the threats are external as much as internal. And external threats are what's going likely to drive uh, how the situation develops within the country itself. The American forces may have left uh, Afghanistan. America has not. Indian uh, consulates may have been emptied, but India has not left. The Taliban seem to be in control. There are a lot of people who are against or anti Taliban. And they were the forces they are going to be propped up, or they're likely to be propped up against Pakistan and Afghanistan, both. Because get if Afghanistan and Pakistan become stable, 
uh, just project in the future 10 years from now if uh, stability is achieved in the immediate future what this region going to look like is i think going to develop mm -hmm. at the fastest possible pace that one can think of because of a lot of other reasons they're talking about that this is what the american led best cannot tolerate like uh, best was alluding to earlier there's a, there's a larger con uh, conflict uh, which is already in place uh, that is between uh, uh, the superpower on the wane and superpower on the rise. China on one hand and America on the other side. And this is consuming a uh, lot of attention from all sides. And they're also consuming a lot of energy from all sides. And this, uh, uh, you know, fallout, on the fallout is the conflict within this region. And Afghanistan and Pakistan is that geographical region where this tussle, uh, in the subtitle, this major tussle will take place. And that is what Pakistan has to guard against. That is what Afghanistan has to guard against. That is why Afghanistan has to be stabilized. And that is why where the regional countries around Afghanistan, uh, they are critical, they are important. Because that is that must be achieved at the, in the shortest possible time. Uh, not allowing uh, these powers to create this support, to support their overall the, the strategic uh, cold war, if you may, uh, or the, the future tussle that we are looking at in the international arena. Absolutely well said. Now, coming to the closing now, Lieutenant General Retire, thank you very much for your time. Ghulam Mustafa, you are a defense analyst. You are joining us on Newswire and also Asif Durrani, former ambassador. Thank you very much for your time now. And gentlemen, there is another tied truism that tells us that the first thing we learn from history is that we do not learn from history. What the British dubbed the first Anglo-Afghan war from 1839 to 1842 came to be known as the disaster in Afghanistan. The second Anglo-Afghan war, 1878 to 1880, the third Anglo-Afghan war of 1919 and the Soviet-Afghan war of the 1979 till 89 all had one thing in common. They all ended in tears with nothing but chaos achieved. There was little reason to believe the American-Afghan war from 2001 to 2021 would have a different outcome. Thank you for watching Newswire.